Hello, ladies and gentlemen, it's Craig Lacey, and I'm here with Akbar Hussein, who's a Narstown Area High School alumni. How you doing today? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thank you for coming. Uh, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I mean, uh, I'm not sure how much you want to know. So I was born in Bangladesh. Uh, my family used to live in Saudi Arabia after that for a while, mm -hmm. and then I actually moved to the U.S. and Narstown here on what's called the Diversity Visa Lottery. Wow. So can you explain to me what that is real quick? Sure. So I think w when you think about the immigration world generally, right, mm -hmm. there, there are only a few certain ways you can actually legally come into the United States. Correct. So one of those ways is if you think about like a work visa. So when, a, uh, uh, when an employer wants to employ you, they, they pay for your visa to come to the U.S. Got you. The other is a student visa, right? If you want to study in the United States from a different country, you can come here. Gotcha. The third way, uh, most generally, uh, which is what a lot of people come to the U.S. through, is called the visit visa, where you come here to visit New York, California, or whatever, to sightsee. And then the fourth way that's a big uh, uh, addition on how people come to the United States is mm -hmm. usually through uh, family. So if gotcha. you have family here, your family wants to bring you. And there's a fifth, wa uh, fifth way that people can come to the U.S., which is a refugee and asylum applications, which mm -hmm. is a little separate from the immigration world, but gotcha. it's still under the same umbrella. And what the United States realized in the 80s was that all of these avenues are actually only open to mm -hmm. people with money. Right. If you have money, you can go to school here. If you have money, you can pay to come visit here. So they were missing a whole host of people from certain countries who uh, bring a diverse perspective that just couldn't get to the U.S. Right. So the State Department established something called the Diversity Visa Lottery. Pretty much it's exactly what it sounds like. There are various different countries in the world that the U.S. does not have enough or did not have enough people uh, here in the U.S. for. So they said, okay, this country, you get 3,000 lottery tickets. This country, you get five. And then people in those countries applied for these tickets, and they were chosen out of a lottery. Uh, we were fortunate to be one of the few families to win that lot uh, lottery back in 2000. Wow. So that's when you moved to Narstown in 2000. Exactly. The 2001 is when we won the lottery in 2000. Then you have to go through an entire series of uh, events, and mm -hmm. then you finally... Uh, get through everything and then we actually arrived to the US on September 9th 2001 September uh, 9th yeah right before the tragic um, attacks on the Twin Towers wow wow that's crazy I mean we're, we're definitely fortunate if you think about oh, it almost uh, definitely are yeah. fortunate here you have a, a Muslim Hussein family traveling from Saudi Arabia coming into the uh, JFK Airport two days prior uh, so uh, we definitely escaped in terms of uh, a lot of issues that could have happened. Right. So when you came to Narstown, how was it different than how it was when you was back at your old place? Sure. So Honestly, I, I get that question a lot, and mm -hmm. it, it, it's hard for me to recall. So I was 10 years old when I first moved here. Right. Uh, sorry, 9 years old, and I turned 10 in December. I moved here in September. Gotcha. Uh, so uh, thinking back in terms of how my life was in Bangladesh, I was only in Bangladesh until I was 4. Oh. And then I moved to Saudi Arabia from four to right around nine. So, so that time in my life is a little hazy. You know, I can barely remember what I ate for dinner last night and then try to think through how my life was back in those two countries. But in the sense of uh, moving into a new culture, a new dynamic, and a new place, it was definitely very different, mm -hmm. right? And then you're moving into a post-9-11 era in where you are moving in as a Muslim student, very young, mm -hmm. uh, very limited understanding of the culture, and then very limited uh, access to English also. So, like, I learned English back in fifth grade when I first moved here. So in that sense, that was also a culture shock. Uh, a culture shock and, and just a shock in general get to know everything that I was doing. So that, that I can speak to, right? This mm -hmm. idea of being a new person in a new environment. But this whole idea of how it differentiates from what I came from, that's a little hazy for me. I understand, especially when you're young. Because when I was young, I lived in New York. And we moved because of 9-11 because it was so crazy there. Exactly. Parents couldn't call me when I was at the daycare. So we came out here to Norristown where my grandparents uh -huh. live. And then after that, we branched off. So you started in the fifth grade. And you learned how you learned English in fifth grade, correct? Sure. So, just explain to us how it was like school here. Was it different than how it was over there, or so? So, in terms of uh, schooling itself, so when we were living in Saudi Arabia, we didn't attend school. Mm 
Right. Uh, so a lot of the private schooling was really expensive, and the school in Saudi Arabia, we, we weren't accustomed to the language in Arabic either because we were Bengalis in Saudi Arabia. Right. So we didn't necessarily attend private school there either. So we had, we lived, so my father was a, a migrant worker in Saudi Arabia, so he used to work in the, one of the steel mills there uh, where he was a laborer right. so, and a welder. So we, we lived in a housing complex that had a lot of these other people from uh, various different countries who are working at this, um, at this company. Right, correct. And then you would have all of these mothers who are uh, semi-well-educated in various different languages, uh, and that's, that was our schooling, right? Our schooling was the environment that we were living in. Uh, we're learning from all of these different people, so you know, because of that, you know, I became fluent in various different languages in there. Uh, it, and then the shock itself was coming into a organized school when you right. come in you have your books and you have to do certain of the readings and that was uh, that, w that was definitely shocking and but it's also a great um, great moment to get used to indeed indeed so what part of high school did you love the most about? Like your best experience of high school, I guess you could say. So I think, you know, high school was a fantastic time for me. Uh, I, was, I was talking to a few students earlier when I first came in. Mm -hmm. It was like, I miss high school. Yeah, I miss the, the, the environment of being in a place where I'm constantly learning from various different people, where I am always doing something new uh, and, and learning something new about yourself. It's a time when you're growing. It's right. a time when you're realizing various different things. Um, uh, one of the most memorable moments of high school for me uh, uh, has been working with a lot of my uh, student council peers. So I was really involved in student council here, and we would host various different you know, events. And uh, that, uh, that itself was a time when I learned how to be a leader, how to engage with various different things. That was very powerful engagement for me, just being in a position where you were doing things that actually had effects both for the community and for the school itself. Um, yeah. Wow. You and me have a lot in common. Student council and we both won Mr. Norristown. So could you explain to us about that performance <laughs> that you did back in 09 for Mr. Norristown? So, so this always seems to come back and this is one of those things I wish I could forget for a little <laughs> but, uh, uh, it, 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 Mr. Norristown was a great time. Uh, I remember uh, as, as senior year came around, we always used to look up to that event. Right? Oh, everybody's, still do. Everybody's always looking out for it. And then uh, uh, for a little bit, I had an interesting time trying to think through whether I should actually do Mr. Norristown or not because I was already involved in student council. I didn't want it to look like, oh, he's, oh, you know, favoritism. he's yeah, favoritism. Oh, I know exactly what like you that. mean. But, but then uh, at a certain point, a lot of my good friends were doing it, and I figured, why not give it a shot? Right. Uh, it was a great time. I remember actually uh, driving down with one of my best friends from uh, high school, Joel and who was uh, who who used to be a big player here in the communication center, mm -hmm. and Mr. Fazzini, who used to work with student council. Yep. We drove down to Philadelphia, and uh, I actually did a video about uh, the Rocky Steps. So like we, you know, I I put on a hooded sweatshirt. We ran through Philly, the meat markets, and then ran oh, up the uh, ran up the uh, art museum steps, and then uh, so that you know those were the fun times that I miss. Mm -hmm. You know, the ability to do almost anything you wanted, uh, you know, as long as you had the direction and you had an idea. There were people here to support you to do that. Right. Um, and so it, it, it was a great time. I, I think I was very lucky to win, right? At, at a certain point, Mr. Norristown, yes, it is about talent of what you're bringing to the table, but I'll tell you, I was, uh, uh, I did the evolution of dance. And you ask any of my friends, I am probably the worst dancer of like anyone that you can <laughs> tell. I have no rhythm, I don't know what I'm doing. So I think at a certain point, it's less about talent, it's a lot about the humor that you bring to it. Indeed. It's a lot, and then probably more than 50% is luck, right? You're at the right place, right okay. time. People like what you're wearing, and that's what happened. Bingo. So, while attending the high school, what teachers influenced you the most? Sure. So I think uh, at the beginning, uh, beginning of my high school career, I, uh, I had Miss Walker Holmes. She was one of my English teachers. And uh, there, there used to be a program here, I'm not sure if it still exists, called the Gifted Program. Uh, and I, was, I wasn't a part of it. Right? So I, was, I was achieving at a certain level, right. but, and, but I was still not included in this Gifted Program. And I'm still not sure uh, how she noticed, but she was like, maybe you should apply for that program. So I was like, okay, let's give it a shot. And then so like uh, there was a psychological examination or something that had to be done for that. Right. And then so like I go down to, uh, I had a guidance counselor at that time to their guidance counselor's office. 
and the examination was about um, you know you you had to follow a certain set of questions. So she right. would be like, okay, you know, did you tell your teacher you're leaving? It would take at least an hour or something to do this interview. We start the interview, and literally within five minutes, she was like, okay, I think we're done. So I was like, okay, this was surprising. And then later I learned that she's supposed to end the interview after I get four questions wrong in a row. Oh, right? wow. So like later my mother received this letter saying like, you know, your son, you know, we're not sure if Norristown has the capacity to handle like the special needs of your kid because I couldn't <laughs> perform to the ability that, that this. So I went and talked to Ms. Walker Holmes. I was like, listen, like, what did you do? Right? They want to kick me out of the school now. So, uh, you know, and then, but, but then she persisted. She was like, no, you, you know, you're a talented student. You should stay here. But then, uh, so she made me retake the exam in a different form, and I did fine, and then I was enrolled in the program. But the whole idea behind that was like uh, the, the thought of uh, teachers recognizing your talents and right. being able to say, uh, you have something, and you can move on to do something bigger. Uh, and Miss Walker Holmes was one of those for me. Obviously, as you go through, I had some great, you know, uh, teachers going through school. Indeed. I had Miss Brownlee, a student council advisor. I had Mr. Fazzini, another one, of uh, the people who greatly influence in terms of how you think, what you do. Uh, Mr. Doyle has been a great presence. Uh, so uh, there, there have been a lot of great influences here, just as an institution, that have helped support me uh, to get to where I am today. Indeed, that's awesome. So. Gifted. It must be kind of special to get it gifted, special. Anyway, let's get back to the interview. Uh, so what college did you attend? So I, uh, I went to Franklin Marshall College in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. So wow. it's a, a small liberal arts college. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, recently they've been doing a lot of great things in terms of inclusion uh, of you know, various diverse options for, for the institution and mm -hmm. providing access to low-income students. Uh, within the arena of higher education, uh, and at the time I went, it was uh, it was a fantastic institution, and now it's even better because of the new steps they're taking. Well, that's fantastic. When you went to college, like, did you have any trouble transitioning from high school to college, or you was cool? I mean, uh, the transitioning was certainly different. So I'm a first generation college grad, right. so no one in my family had gone to college before I went, and then thank you, but. Um, it, and Franklin Marshall, at the time I went, was known to be an institution where really bright students went, right? Mm -hmm. But it, it, along with that title of being bright also came a lot of these students who had uh, enormous amount of wealth. So they were coming from families who, oh, exactly who can who can exactly, so it was a, so I went on scholarships. So a lot of them, uh, I was very fortunate to be able to get financial aid mm -hmm. to pay for uh, most of my education needs. But a lot of my classmates would pay the entire tuition, like their parents would be able to pay the entire right, tuition. So they, which was, was, they didn't have no problem with it. Exactly. So for me to be able to walk into college and be get adjusted to the social dynamic of that, right, the socioeconomic differences between what I am bringing, which is, you know, this student from Norristown, this kid right. from Norristown who grew up in a row home, uh, trying to adjust to the lifestyle of these people who are paying $60,000 a year right off cash, uh, that, that was definitely different. In terms of the academics itself, I didn't think uh, that was any more challenging than what I had experienced here at the high school. Uh, and it's all about a mindset, right? You, you're, you're going to college to better yourself. You're going to college to represent something for your community, for your parents. Mm -hmm. And th so the drive was there, and there was nothing wrong with that. But the issues uh, came when I was trying to adjust to the lifestyle right. and the socioeconomic styles of. Man, uh, I understand exactly. Well, I don't understand, but I see where you're coming from. Got to respect that. Got to respect it. So what, co uh, not, what was your major at college? So I was a government major. Mm -hmm. So in most uh, universities and bigger schools, it's the same thing as political science. Right. But I think there was less scientific research in terms of the, our major at the undergrad, so right. they called it government. Awesome. That's what I awesome. said. So when you graduated, did you have the same major that you started out college out with? Yeah, so I, I, was, um, so I was student council president here at the high school. I was also involved in the school board. And, uh, and I had done similar things in middle school at Stewart where I went. Um, and then so I always had an interest in community development and, uh, and accessing various uh, opportunities to help community. And I saw that as, uh, as an avenue to the best way to do that for me 
uh, before I went to college, I thought was through governance, hmm. right? Get involved in politics or just be involved in the governing structure and then you can make big level changes. Right. So I, I went in thinking that's what I wanted to do. I want to get involved in government in some way. Uh, but, it, 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 and then, you know, there's always in the back of the head was, okay, you can go study government, but you should go to law school because lawyers do big changes. Right. But then once I got there, I realized like I really enjoy the governing part of it, and that's what I focused on, and that's what I continued doing. So I right. did stay. Uh, I started off as a government major, and I ended as a government major. Awesome. So you told me earlier, Walker Holmes gave you the gift, the achievement, you got the little letter, then after that got scholarships. So can you tell us about a little bit more about the great achievements you have achieved in your life? So, I mean, yeah, honestly, if you think about it, the biggest achievement that I've achieved in my life was actually graduating high school, mm. right? You know, getting through, because coming from a country, uh, you know, Bangladesh, I don't know how much you know about Bangladesh. So, it's, it's in Southeast Asia, right? It Form used them, to be, right. it used to be part of India. So, India, Pakistan, and Bangladesh used to be the same country. Okay. Uh, and then there was a war that separated India and Pakistan. Gotcha. And then... Pakistan still had control of Bangladesh, and India was in the middle. So, like, Pakistan's all the way up here, India's in the middle, and then you have Bangladesh down here. So, like, Pakistan had this weird control over Bangladesh. Gotcha. Then there was a war, Bangladesh separated. I only say all of that because Bangladesh is a very small country. Gotcha. In terms of size, it's the same size as Pennsylvania, a little oh, bigger. Yeah. You know how many people live in Pennsylvania? No, I do not. About 13 million people live in Pennsylvania. And in terms of Bangladesh, it's the same size with about 155 million people who live there. So it's, a, it's one of the world's most densely populated country, and then more than a quarter of that population live below uh, $2 a day. So Dang. that's the environment that my parents were born in, that's the environment that I was born in. So for me, you know, walking through that stage in high school, and then walking through that stage in, uh, at Franklin Marshall College, right. those are the biggest achievements in mm. my life. And then you'll read my bio, you'll see a lot of other things. I've had various ex uh, externships and internships. Uh, most recently, I was awarded the Paul and Daisy Soros Fellowship for New Americans. On that too. Uh, thank you. So it's awarded to 30 students around the country uh, who are uh, children of immigrants. And then uh, in undergrad, I was. Uh, awarded the Truman Scholarship, which is awarded to about 50 to 60 students around the entire country. Awesome. So I also heard that you are part of Men of Excellence, Norristown Men of Excellence. Yeah. How did you get involved in that? So Norristown Men of Excellence is a fantastic organization that's doing incredible work for Norristown itself. Uh, I was, so I graduated from Franklin Marshall College in 2013. Yes. And then I decided to move to Washington, D.C., and I worked there for about two years. And then I wanted to move back to home because I started missing home. I wanted to get involved in the community. And so that's when I applied to law school. Uh, and then I was fortunately admitted to University of Pennsylvania Law School. And then on my way back, I reached out to various different people I knew in Norristown who were really involved. One being Mr. Hadrick, who used to be a guidance counselor, my guidance counselor here at the high school. His son, Trey Hadrick, had started a program called the Norristown Men of Excellence. Mm -hmm. uh, about three years before I moved back. Wow. Uh, so he mm -hmm. told me, you should get involved with Trey, give him a call. I gave Trey a call. I was like, listen, I'm coming back home. I want to get involved. Uh, he was like, yeah, jump on board. So I, there's an application process. I went through all the brothers there, decided uh, I was a fit for what they're looking for. Uh, but pretty much what the organization does is they're a pillar in the community for uh, after school activities, for uh, improvement of Norristown through various different programming. Right. And that's what I want to be involved in, right? It's a community that I grew up in. Indeed. It's a community that I'm still a part of. My sister goes to Whitehall now. Uh, so it's a community that we want to keep giving back to. And the Indeed. best way to do that is through uh, a group of men who went to Norristown Area High School, uh, who graduated from Norristown Area High School, have all gone to college, and now are back in the town giving back. And that's the focus of the uh, organization, and that's how I got involved. Awesome, awesome. Besides Men of Excellence, how else are you involved in the community? So uh, there, there are various different uh, ways that I see what I would like to do in terms of uh, giving back, right? right. One is through um, visibility and access, right? Visibility matters, access matters to a lot of different people, right. and uh, specifically low-income students. And the best way to do that for me is through Narstown Men of Excellence. The second tier of what I really like to do is community development. 
uh, and community development through economic means. And the best way for me to do that was I reached out to a good friend of mine who's also a member of Nurse Seminar of Excellence, Councilman Hakeem Jones. Uh, uh, I know exactly so he, he was elected right as I was coming in, and he's a young elected official. And uh, I asked him, how can I get involved in community economic development, right? So like doing all these, doing all these things for students is great. But what I really want to do is get involved with the real community, right? How do we bring more jobs for people? How do we uh, find ways that uh, are sustainable for people to stay in Norristown? Right. So he told me there was a position opening in the Norristown Planning Commission, and I should apply for that. I did. I was fortunate to be selected. So one of my biggest portfolio things that I do now is actually the Planning Commission Board. Right. So a lot of businesses and development that happen in Norristown has to go through the Planning Commission Board. So it's doing exactly what I want to do, which is getting involved in the economics of the city. Uh, and so that's the other big thing that I do. Man, your catalog is just amazing. You meet and boom, boom. You meet, you meet some high-powered people. Speaking of high-powered people, I've heard, and I've heard, I don't know if this is right, but you met Barack Obama? So, I mean, it... <laughs> I, I guess it depends on how you look at it, right? So I was an intern back at the White House mm -hmm. in my junior year of uh, undergraduate school. That's uh, amazing. So it, in that capacity, I worked in an office called the Office of Public Engagement and Intergovernmental Affairs. Uh, and a lot of the work that we did at that time was uh, engaging with the general public, a lot of local elected officials, so their council members and mayors of the entire country. And what that entailed was every time a mayor or a council member was in uh, at the White House or a, every time the president was visiting one of these towns, we will be in charge of organizing it, we will be in charge of providing tickets and things like that. So in that capacity, I was present in rooms in the White House while the president was there. Did I sit down and have coffee with him? I wish, but I didn't. So meeting, I think that's an interesting way of describing it. Sure, I met him, right? But it was never in a very intimate setting, I wouldn't say, no. All right, but still, still, he was in the presence of a president. Yo. It was, it, yeah, it was definitely <laughs> a fantastic feeling, and the aura around when someone like that walks into a room is pretty incredible. Awesome, so your first name is Akbar, so I'm guessing you're Muslim? I mean, it's an interesting guess, but sure, yeah. Uh, were you born Muslim or you converted? Yeah, so uh, another, I guess another thing I, get, I didn't mention when I was giving you the history of Bangladesh is Bangladesh is about 80, 80 to 85% Muslim country, right. uh, Sunni Muslim country, so I was born a Muslim. Yeah. So am I, alhamdulillah. So how do you feel about Muslims in this, how do you feel Muslims are looked at in our society? Whew, that's big, that's a big question. So I, you know, I've been thinking about this uh, recently, uh, and I think there's a there's an in interesting uh, push from a certain you know aspect of a conservative right wing push of demonizing this entire religion. Right. Right. We have to think about the Islamic world in the sense of there are 1.6 billion Muslims in the entire world, and then unfortunately there are issues that are going on in certain parts of the world, and from a very small group of people that are uh, that are catalyze into this huge issue here in the U.S. through the media. So I think some of the issues facing our community, the Muslim community, in my uh, opinion, are, again, issues of access and visibility, right? So there are only about three million Muslims in the entire United States, and most of the Muslims live on the coast, right? So when it comes to the voting preferences of people, when it comes to uh, how people portray a Muslim or think about a Muslim, especially in middle America and even middle of Pennsylvania, right. they are basing all of those opinions on their lack of access to an actual Muslim American. Exactly. Right? Because they see whatever's happening in the media and they are... They're believing you know, it. They're believing it. So I think that's a big issue, right? The issue of visibility for a lot of... Uh, access to a Muslim to a lot of people. I agree with I don't. Definitely. I don't think that... Uh, justifies all of the hatred and everything that's going on, but I do think that's something that the Muslim community has to think about, right? That we are not accessible all over the place. Uh, and the other thing is visibility, right? There's just not enough of us in major, uh, uh, we're not major players in any of the games, right? right. Politics, uh, healthcare, whatever it is. 
so I think visibility in terms of uh, being present in various different places, that's also not there. So I haven't th thought of that. I recently wrote an uh, op-ed for the Philadelphia Inquirer saying, listen, I, I sort of get, right, like all of this craziness that's right. in people's head, right, because that's all you see. You, uh, and I sort of get that. Like I'm not going to, I'm not going to let you say that's enough to hate me, right? But I get that why a lot of people are sort of mad. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, I wrote an op-ed saying, listen, if you're really afraid of a Muslim, right? If you, if you really want to know what's going on, come talk to me, right? I'm in Philly. Uh, Philly actually is the has the largest growing Muslim population, yes, African-American Muslim population in the entire country. So Philly is a very diverse, and thriving, Philly has a very diverse and thriving Muslim community. Indeed Come talk does. to us, right? There are plenty of mosques. There are over, uh, I would say over 50 mosques in the entire Philadelphia region. So if you're really afraid, come talk to me and I'll be there. And the response has been incredible. I received over 300 emails from people saying, you know, I, I'd love to have coffee with you and talk to you about various different things. And I think that that is an incredible uh, uh, anecdote to the crazy issues that are out there today. And I agree with you most definitely. I love what you do. It's not like you're just gonna write back at them. You rather justify just showing what's wrong and what they emulate, that's what's wrong. I, I love that. So next week, Ramadan is coming up. Will yeah, you be absolutely. participating in that? So I think uh, it, it's it's definitely, yes, I'll, I, I will be participating to the best of my ability. Inshallah. Right, inshallah. And, but at a certain point, uh, you do have to recognize that it is at one of the toughest times of the year. Indeed, right? it, it, it moves back in a certain way where Ramadan, you have to experience it in every month of the year. Unfortunately, this will be one of the toughest months of the year because it falls right in the middle of the summer. I think I am in an incredible position to have an office job where I don't have to worry about it. Oh, but yeah. I think there are a lot of Muslims around the world who are struggling who are suffering, who actually have to do construction or some other type of work. And uh, Ramadan becomes incredibly difficult for those people. And I pray to God and I pray for those people that they can hopefully do that to the best of their ability. Indeed, indeed. So anything for everybody watching, just something you would want to tell the viewers. Well, listen, I, I had a great time being here. Thank you so much uh, for having me. I think it's... Uh, you know, we, we all have a lot to learn from each other, right? It, it's an incredible lesson of it doesn't matter how bright you are. It doesn't matter how many degrees you have. I always have something more that I can learn with anyone that I run into. Uh, and that's a lesson I think it's important for everyone to recognize is to, uh, is to see that the good in people, but also to recognize that it doesn't matter wherever you go or who you're talking to, you can le learn something from them, whether it's me or whether it's you. Uh, and that's what I want to leave people with. Indeed, indeed. Man, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Yeah, I'm absolutely. Craig Lacey, and I just talked to Akbar Hussein, just an alumni that came back and showed love to the great high school that we have, and now a special presentation with Corinne and Thaddeus.